submarines. Secretive, silent, lethal. Once they dive, they become near invisible predators, stalking the ocean depths. But the world they inhabit is one of the harshest environments on the planet. If something goes wrong, crew could be trapped hundreds of meters down with the temperature falling fast, water flooding in and oxygen rapidly running out. Escaping from otherwise certain death takes remarkable courage, tough training and incredible ingenuity. In this half-hour special, How Do They Do It has exclusive access to the work of the world's leading submarine rescue specialists. So, how do they do it? The historic naval port of Cartagena, southern Spain. It's late May and 20 vessels from 10 different nations are heading out into the Mediterranean. They've come to take part in Bold Monarch, the world's largest submarine escape and rescue exercise. Two thousand elite personnel from all over the world, setting aside political differences to practice saving lives. This is Commander Charlie Neve. Ahora empuja uno, favor. And this is shooting star. We are ready to stand by this channel. Today, specialists from the U.S., Spain, Britain, and seven other navies will work together to locate a sunken submarine and rescue the crew from the bottom of the sea. Everything will be done as if this was a real life and death emergency. At 0700 hours, the submarine slips beneath the waves and does the unthinkable. It deliberately sinks to the ocean floor and shuts down its engines. If this was a real emergency, the crew would only have a few days clean air to live on. Over the years, more than 100 submarines have sunk following non-combat accidents with the loss of over 2,600 lives. In 2000, 118 Russian submariners died after a torpedo accidentally detonated on the Kursk. Today, there are more than 500 submarines in service around the world. The next accident could happen anywhere. And when the call for help goes out, the nearest rescue system may not belong to an ally. So the aim of this exercise is to ensure that any rescue sub can come to the aid of any stricken submarine, regardless of nationality. Because in an emergency, the faster the response, the more lives can be saved. One point five knots. Lieutenant Commander Stuart Little is in charge of NATO's submarine rescue system, based in Fastlane, Scotland. Time is almost always the critical factor. We look at getting from our base to on the scene in about 72 hours. It's a huge logistic task and logistic train to bring 350 tonnes of stuff from Scotland to wherever the ship is. For today's mission to succeed, it's going to call on all the technology and manpower the fleet can muster. The French ship, the Pourquoi Pas, comes loaded with sub-detection equipment and a squad of rescue divers. Accompanying them to the deep will be the Italians in their armored newt suits. The Russians on the Epron have steel diving bells to taxi survivors to the surface. While the Italians, NATO and the Americans have brought three bespoke rescue subs. Help is also coming from the air. On call to fly anywhere in the world at six hours' notice are the UK's Submarine Parachute Assistance Group. Dropping from the skies with life rafts, submarine communications equipment, medical supplies and emergency oxygen, they can set up a floating field hospital above the disabled sub. But while these guys are the best in the world, the next few hours will test every ounce of their abilities. Because when it comes to sub-rescue, nothing is certain. Things can always go wrong. 
on the sea floor, the 1,500-ton Spanish submarine, the Galerna, is waiting to be rescued. This is Gold Alpha Lima. 54 men are crammed into this 6.8-meter-wide metal tube. With her diesel-electric engines shut down, she has only five to seven days air supply. A decade ago, when the Kursk went down, it took nine days for the first diver to reach her. Now, international coordination ensures that help will be on the scene in under 72 hours. In case of an emergency, we have to hit this button and it will send a signal to the surface ships. The signal sounds like ping, 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 and it, will be, it would be possible to locate us. As the Spanish sub plays dead, the Americans on the support ship, the Shooting Star, arrive at her last known position. You can see the smoke flare that the submarine has released, showing us their location. Speedboats are sent out so that the stranded sub knows help is on its way. The small boat is used to create noise in the water, and that will help the submarine to be able to hear that noise. They can tell us what direction they hear that noise from, and then we can use that to triangulate a position to where that submarine is. To further narrow down the search area, they deploy their sonar equipment. By bouncing sound waves down from the surface onto the sub and measuring how long they take to come back, they can pin down its position and establish what angle it's lying at on the sea floor. Even if she's lying at a 60-degree angle, a rescue sub will be able to lock on. As the teams on the surface keep searching, on board the crew are not only using up their oxygen supply, they're also breathing out toxic carbon dioxide. If this sub was really in trouble, then getting a supply of clean air to the crew could buy them vital time, allowing a rescue sub to be sent out to help them. On board the French search vessel, a group of specialist divers prepare to head to the stranded submarine to provide oxygen and vent any toxic gases. As they reach the sub, the divers attach the supply tube Next, they purge the valves. Job done. One signals to the other that it's time to head back up. But even for experienced Navy divers, this is still a very risky procedure. Every time we came on the surface, it's a kind of relief. And uh, we are very proud uh, of the job we have done uh, on the bottom. Scuba divers like Uber can work for about two hours at depths of up to 60 meters. But a stranded sub could be several hundred meters down. Getting air to subs at these depths requires a lot more than a wetsuit. This is an atmospheric diving suit. It's a wearable submarine. The bionic hands enable a diver to clear debris and deliver air and supplies to subs lying 600 meters underwater. The cast aluminum body means the pressure inside the suit can be kept at one atmosphere, even when the water pressure outside is 60 times that. But if anything goes wrong at those depths, every diver knows this could be his last dive. This is, uh, I think, the most dangerous work you can have in, um, in, in the Navy. We know that it's very high risky, and every time that you put your heads under the water, you're not sure that you're not coming up. Out of the water, the 378 kilogram suit is dead weight. But under the ocean, the diver is a nautical astronaut. On the way down to the sub, he encounters all kinds of strange species. Today, he's checking the sub's escape hatches are clear. 
unlike scuba divers, his aquatic armour means he can work for six hours straight. The diver steers with thrusters on his back, operated by foot pedals. But cameras and his air supply hoses are controlled from above the water. And hundreds of metres down, if thrusters or air supply fail, he'll be on his own. Down there, it's a just another world because there is no lights, temperature is very cold. Uh, even if you are the best diver in the world, it's always a different situation. In an emergency, he can deliver food, medical supplies and atmosphere control chemicals to the disabled submarine. But one thing he can't do is rescue anyone. So the next step in Bold Monarch will be a real-life submarine escape. It may be an exercise, but it's every bit as terrifying as the real thing. Open slowly, please. And it calls for some of the most advanced equipment in the oceans and some of the bravest people in the skies. Still to come, the most dangerous part of any submarine rescue. How do the crew of a stricken submarine escape to the surface from deep beneath the ocean? Join us after the break to find out how on How Do They Do It? Off the coast of southern Spain, Vessels from 10 navies and 2,000 personnel have gathered for the world's largest submarine rescue exercise. Star, we are ready. In this half-hour special, How Do They Do It has been given exclusive access to follow the world's leading rescue experts as they scour the depths for an attack submarine that has sunk to the sea floor. To begin with, the rescue teams have practiced locating and supplying clean air to the stranded submarine. But now things are about to become a lot more dangerous. If a sub is flooding or filling with toxic gases, then there simply isn't time to wait for help to arrive. In these cases, there's only one means of escape, and it's absolutely petrifying. These guys are donning submarine escape immersion suits. Trapped up to 180 metres underwater, and in total darkness, they're going to open a hatch and float to the surface. And this oxygen-fed suit is their only protection. Huddled in the submarine's escape lock, water floods in. The pressure rises rapidly until it matches the sea pressure outside. Once the pressures are equalised, they open the hatch. And thanks to the suit's inbuilt buoyancy, they rocket into the void, rising to the surface at a speed of three metres a second. But as they ascend, air inside their lungs expands. If they don't control their breathing, it can cause serious internal injuries. Even if they make it to the surface alive, their problems don't end there. Alone in the vast oceans, they could be critically injured. Luckily, help is on its way. This is the UK's Submarine Parachute Assistance Group, a.k.a. SPAG. This elite airborne unit hurled themselves, medical kit and, astonishingly, speedboats onto the disaster site at 400 kilometres per hour. Dropping from 250 metres means they're accurate, but for parachutists, that's insanely low. canisters flip open. Within minutes, the SPAG team creates a floating A&E. The leaky life raft village looks pretty basic. But for an escapee, it could mean the difference between life and death. Medic Jane treats burns and other injuries. The immersion suit protects against hypothermia and supplies air during the escape. 
but the biggest danger is the change in pressure causing a condition called barotrauma. When your submariners are escaping from depth, now if you don't breathe out, that means you're going to burst your lungs. Below 180 metres, this barotrauma is likely to be fatal. For most of the 20th century, if a sub got into trouble at these depths, there was no means of escape. But now there are more than a dozen advanced rescue subs around the world that can reach these depths and rescue the crew of a damaged submarine. However, replicating these scenarios is extremely dangerous. The Spanish submarine Galerna is about to simulate just such a crisis. <laughs> It's currently lying at the same depth as the Kursk submarine, in which 118 sailors died. Preparing to come to its rescue is NATO's submarine rescue vehicle, or SRV. Jointly operated by France, Norway and Britain, this newly built mini-sub is probably the most advanced equipment of its type in the world. Nicknamed Nemo, she can dive over 600 metres to save submariners. The aim is to take Nemo down to the Galerna, dock on and open the hatches between the two vessels. The pilots are Alan Scott and Tom Heron, while Lieutenant Commander Little will run things from the bridge. They've practised this many times, but that doesn't make it any less dangerous. As the deckhands lower Nemo into the sea, inside the rescue sub, the team ensure that all systems are functioning perfectly. In the water, check your seals. At the controls, Alan starts to guide her down towards the disabled submarine, or DISUB. Nemo, Nemo control. DISUB bears zero, 060, zero. range 100 metres. Over. As Nemo heads down, thousands of tons of water pressure squeeze her hull. It takes Alan 30 minutes to guide the sub to the seabed. Nemo, Nemo control. Tracking has you at the disub. Request visibility. Over. It's hatched here, just in front of us. Yeah, just coming up now. With the disabled submarine, the Galerna, in sight, Alan now tries to align the hatches. But with currents buffeting him, this is enormously challenging. He then gingerly lowers Nemo onto the top of the disub. Okay, everybody happy? With the two subs touching, the team pumps out water trapped between the hatches. Doing this should glue one sub to the other. There's no clamps or locks, it's just differential in pressure between external sea pressure and internal pressure. Once we've got that differential in pressure, we're like a limpet. We just suck on there, we just stay on there. With millions of tonnes of ocean threatening to pour in, they carefully open the hatch and check for any problems. of the Spanish sub can now do the same. But this goes against their most basic instincts. And obviously the submarine doesn't want to open up a hatch because it's a, it's a very alien thing to do at this depth. So for the submarine captain, this is probably one of the most dangerous times that, that he has. For the crews of both subs, this is the most critical time. Open slowly, please. We're 107 metres of water and we've got hatches open. We don't want to cause any danger because at any time, if we were to do something wrong, then it could be catastrophic. OK, we are ready to transfer the passengers. Roger, passengers, Hola, senor. Hola. After Hola. hours stuck on the sea floor, a relieved submariner is safely rescued. 
You're welcome to Nemo. Thank you very much. But while the crew may now be on board, Alan's job is only half done. Venting and closing the hatches is extremely dangerous, and a series of strict protocols has to be followed. If we don't do this, then the potential is that we can have a catastrophic failure and everyone in the submersible will die. That's just, that's the facts of it. That's the way it happened. Easing the two subs apart, Alan then heads back to the surface. But the rescued crew could be injured, burned or suffering the bends. Fortunately, this clever little sub has another trick up her sleeve. After being hoisted out of the water, she neatly docks onto an onboard decompression chamber. And the sub's crew can be safely transferred inside to recuperate. In a real-life emergency, Nemo could make a series of return trips, bringing every one of the stricken sub's crew safely to the surface in less than 24 hours. For Team Nemo, it's been a textbook rescue. They, the divers, the parachuting medics and the rest of this incredible fleet have shown that in an emergency, the world's navies can work together, saving lives and preventing another tragedy like the loss of the crew of the Kursk. So next time you're stranded 300 metres underwater in a leaking sub, don't call 999. Go on better. Call these guys.